Greetings and welcome to the University of Minnesota Alumni Association's webinar series. My name is John Ruzek and I'm the Vice President of Engagement for the Alumni Association. Thank you for joining us today for today's webinar, Memory, Trauma and Human Rights at the Crossroads of Art and Science. Today's webinar brings together three University of Minnesota expert professors who seek to better understand the impacts of trauma upon individuals and societies and how we come to terms with and deal uh, uh, how we come to terms with and heal from trauma, seek accountability for past human right abuses, and mitigate future traumatization. Uh, before the presentation, just a couple of announcements. Today's webinar is part of an ongoing free series offered by the Alumni Association, where we have conversations with experts about career, life, and learning topics. Uh, initiatives like the webinar series are made possible in part by our uh, Alumni Association members, so thank you. And if you're interested in learning more about membership, visit us at umnalumni.org slash membership. Uh, just a couple housekeeping items for today's webinar. You have joined the presentation listening using your computer speaker system by default. Uh, if uh, you would like to move to the telephone on the GoToWebinar control panel, just select telephone in the audio pane of the panel and dial-in information will be displayed. And if you're experiencing difficulties while listening via your computer speaker, um, this sometimes can be caused by having multiple applications open or um, being on a Wi-Fi signal. So perhaps move over to a hardwired signal. Uh, questions will be welcome at the end of the presentations. Uh, each presenter will be presenting for about 15 minutes apiece. apiece. Uh, please type in your questions in the questions pane on the GoToWebinar control panel, and I'll be looking at them along the way. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce today's featured speakers. Uh, Brian Ingdahl is the William L. Anderson Chair in PTSD Research and Adjunct Professor uh, from Neuroscience, Psychology and Cognitive Sciences at the University of Minnesota. His PTSD research and treatment with US veterans combines a clinic, clinician's perspective with scholarly investigation. Ophelia Ferran is an associate professor in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese Studies at the University of Minnesota. Her work explores literary and visual artistic production that not only articulates trauma, but generates a new sense of community and calls for justice in post-Civil War and post-dictatorship Spain. Uh, Ana Forsenito is a professor in Arsham and Charlotte oh, Ohanesan, a chair in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese Studies here at the U of M as well. Her work on testimonial and artistic practices in Latin America addresses the representation of human rights violations and the role of aesthetics in constructing narratives and memories. Um, sorry, uh, their, their project is made possible through the generous support of the College of Liberal Arts uh, Interdisciplinary Collaborative Workshop, the Institute of Advanced Study, and the Imagine Fund. So welcome to all three professors to the alumni webinar series, and Brian will start us off today. Welcome, Brian. Okay. Thank you, John. Uh, the title of my short presentation is The History and Definitions of PTSD. So we're coming at it from a medical and uh, scientific perspective in this brief section. Uh, I am a full-time employee of the uh, VA Medical Center out at the Brain Sciences Center. We are physically located there and we're doing uh, some very exciting research on PTSD and other conditions that affect brain function. There are three of us who uh, kind of head things up. Uh, Lisa James on the left, she's a professor of um, Healthy Women's Brain Aging in Neuroscience. There's me in the middle, and there is Professor, Regents Professor, Apostolos Georgiopoulos, and we're gathered around our high-tech brain scanner uh, called a MEG. That's for another lecture. You can check us out if you simply Google Brain Sciences and uh, learn some more. Brain Sciences Center, our research does focus on almost anything that affects uh, brain function, and uh, <clears throat> chief among them, PTSD, more recently traumatic brain injury, something called Gulf War illness or chronic multi-symptom illness. We've got some treatment trials going. 
the Healthy Brain Project, as mentioned, is ongoing and a very interesting one. Plus, we do a lot of basic work, even some animal work on uh, motor control and movement disorders. All right, PTSD, about 2000 BC. <clears throat> Here's an image uh, taking us back to uh, the Sumerians, Mesopotamia, King Ur Urnama's battle of death. He was killed. His army was destroyed, the people and uh, the city of Ur were pretty much wiped out. And the survivors described in carvings upon stone uh, the earliest known written record of nightmares, anxiety, uh, extreme uh, hypervigilance, fear, uh, something we would recognize today as PTSD. Certainly, uh, as we come through literature, we look at the writings of Homer and others about uh, the adjustment or lack thereof among their uh, heroes following their uh, uh, battle engagements. We see descriptions of uh, something we could call PTSD. Shakespeare talks about it. The image here in front of you is uh, Napoleon and his troops retreat from Moscow the winter of 1812, and uh, the French <clears throat> wrote about it, talked about it, experienced it in battle. Germans, Russians, Swiss, Spanish, um, they, they seem to organize around a term called nostalgia, where a soldier who would be uh, traumatized would become ineffective in combat, uh, express a desire to return home, hence nostalgia and uh, be unable to sleep and so forth. So it got written about in that way, in that era. In our own American Civil War, there was a physician named Da Costa who uh, examined and wrote about and attempted to treat quite a few veterans, particularly uh, those who fought for the North, who experienced um, extreme nervousness, uh, inability to sleep, a great deal of tension, and heartbeats that would race at the slightest exertion, hence the term soldier's heart. Uh, and uh, it was uh, this group that we today would probably look at through the lens of post-traumatic stress disorder. Certainly uh, trench warfare uh, on the Western Front in World War I, uh, created a great deal of uh, not only um, distress and suffering for those who experienced it and a lot of attempts by, uh, in particular, British psychiatrists to understand and treat it, but a lot of literature flowed from the accounts and uh, subsequent writings of those who um, experienced trench warfare. Can we think about Lord of the Rings, folks? <laughs> All right, here's a bit of ephemeral art from the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I, Shores of Britain. These are uh, sketches of soldiers, November 2018, uh, 11th hour, 11th day, the end of World War I. They still remember it there quite vividly. Uh, more recently in America, it was put in front of us on the PBS broadcast series by Ken Burns, The War, focusing on America's involvement in the Vietnam War, and uh, perspectives provided by the soldiers on both sides, uh, the Viet Cong, the North Vietnamese regulars, and the American soldiers who fought in that war, giving rise to the modern construction I'll talk about here in a minute, PTSD. <clears throat> Vietnam combat vets were not going to take um, ignoring of their problems uh, lying down. This was a climate of social activism in the 70s, women's movement, civil rights movement. The official manual of the American Psychiatric Association had treated them and other survivors of trauma rather badly. So we do have in 1952 DSM-1 um, gross stress reaction. But it was expected that that would resolve. You experienced trauma as an adult. You were uh, affected for no more than six months. Otherwise, there was something wrong further back in your history, perhaps in your childhood. It fell off the books in DSM-1, 1968. 
the closest thing was something called uh, adjustment reaction to adult life. It could include combat, but unplanned pregnancies and other stressful experiences. Um, DSM-3, as I said, uh, was came forth uh, from a climate of social activism. A psychiatrist from Iowa, Nancy Andreessen, who had served on burn wards as a psychiatrist in training, she knew darn well that PTSD existed. She saw it in her patients. She brought together a diverse coalition of combat veterans, Holocaust survivors, their children, sexual assault survivors, and they came up with um, a classification based on 12 symptoms in three groups. There have been later revisions of the DSM. There's 3R, added some symptoms, changed them around as to what group they were in. Four, kept those symptoms, three groups. Five, which is out there now, 2013, includes 20 symptoms, four groups, and there's some discontinuity across the versions. We'll see how that plays out. Uh, the World Health Organization, the dominant medical organization for the rest of the world, puts out something called ICD. ICD-11 is out or almost out. They've gone the other direction and narrowed the definition of PTSD to six symptoms. And uh, <clears throat> We'll see um, how this works out, at least in the research arena. The treatment arena is also affected because uh, treatment is authorized re and reimbursed based on these manuals. What is PTSD? <clears throat> um, in my view, it's uh, an unfortunate <laughs> mashup of the terms trauma and stress. Uh, why I say that is because trauma when it uh, affects you long term, it by definition has overwhelmed your ability to cope. Uh, stress, which is a separable field of study and treatment. Stress is something we all live with, um, we cope with, and um, it's just part of our daily lives. It's part of the human experience. Interestingly, trauma itself is, uh, for many of us, the uh, lifetime rates in the United States for exposure to one or more uh, life-threatening events uh, is two-thirds, three-quarters. Uh, most of us at some point along the way will have a brush with a trauma. Whether we all become traumatized or not is coming up in a subsequent slide. The essence of PTSD across these versions of DSM uh, first and foremost are the permanent painful memories that are formed uh, through the process of traumatization. People um, close their eyes and they can see it happening again. People have nightmares. Something reminds them and they almost can see it again. It's called a flashback. They become permanently more aroused. They become hyper aroused. They become fearful in situations that previously did not arouse fear. To try to control and minimize hyperarousal and fear <clears throat> and the resurrection of painful memories, uh, people in, engage in understandable maneuvers of avoidance, avoidance of reminders, avoidance of talking about it, withdrawing, withdrawing from the environment, withdrawing from people around them. Uh, there is some degree of culture specificity. It's not great, but it needs to be taken into account. Some cultures do focus more on the physical experience of <clears throat> stomach ache, pain, headache as a way to express their trauma reaction. Uh, there is also a subclass of reactions where people lose contact with reality. It's called dissociation. They um, become uh, unaware of their surroundings and are hard to pull back. The diagnosis of PTSD, like most psychiatric diagnoses, often occurs in combination with other disorders that can be somewhat separate out, separated out, depression, substance abuse, and so forth. What predicts uh, who will get PTSD besides the trauma exposure itself and genetics? Uh, low social support is nearly universal. 
that is kind of bi-directional. And by that, I mean that if you lack social support and you have been traumatized, you are more likely to develop PTSD. If you develop PTSD and you engage in a lot of avoidance and withdrawal, you're going to, for that reason, experience less social support. You're not around people, you're not open to them and so forth. General life stress predicts PTSD as does the uh, severity of the trauma, the number of times you've been traumatized, and the agent. By that, I mean that um, natural disasters on average do not uh, trigger as much PTSD as being uh, assaulted by uh, another human being. And so we see the highest rates of PTSD among survivors of physical assault and rape. Childhood adversity sets the stage for the development of PTSD, all other things being equal. Um, if you are not highly educated, if you are not extremely bright, you stand a lower chance of being able to benefit from the therapy you are offered. Being poor, having first degree relatives with mental disorders, being female, females on average are more likely to develop PTSD. Previous trauma sets the stage for PTSD in the face of current trauma. It's not true that whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. It may make you more likely to develop PTSD. Uh, the younger you are at the time of the trauma, the more likely PTSD. And if you experience out-of-body sensations at the time of the trauma, traumatic dissociation also increases the risk. Or is it because of your childhood? This is the way I was trained in the 70s. Um, adults got over whatever they experienced and did not develop anything we might now call PTSD. Um, therefore, um, perhaps the psychoanalytic approach uh, analyzing childhood and subconscious conflicts would be the way to go. Um, I think with that, I will wrap it up and turn it over to... All right, we'll, we'll get uh, Professor uh, Forcinito's uh, uh, <coughs> deck up here. Just one moment. We have uh, multiple decks here today, so we'll get it queued up. Right. Welcome, Professor. Thank you, John. Uh, what I want to do today is to discuss what is that the artistic and literary process can teach us about the way in which trauma is manifested in narratives. I will use examples from Argentina. I will also be making reference to the last military dictatorship and to human rights violations, uh, violence against women and the Malvinas Falkland War. Let's start with the first part of the title of our collaborative, Trauma, Memory and Human Rights. When we think about human rights, many of us focus on trials, international norms, domestic laws and commissions of truth. And we underline truth, justice and the official process of memorialization. What we often forget is the crucial role played by artistic manifestations and cultural practices in general in the rewriting of the past and in the transformation of culture. When thinking about human rights, our expectations are many times to get the facts about what happened, even with numbers, graphs, and statistics. These images, for example, belong to the report of the Commission of Truth in Argentina, and they represent not only the official narrative of the report, but also the attempt to translate the large number of testimonies they received into graphs. In this case, about the places of kidnapping and about the numbers of disappearances per year. In addition, the report has also many testimonies of survivors that focus on some of these facts, as in this example by Adriana Calvo de Daborde, a testimony included in the Nunca Mas Never Again report. And of course, this is a very central part of the struggle for the respect of, of justice and human rights. But when we think about literature and the arts, narratives don't have to provide only the facts about the, the past. These narratives can focus on the difficulties of remembering, on the gaps of the narratives, or even the inconsistencies, 
and on the different emotions attached to the traumatic experience or the interpretations of the traumatic events, and even point to the difficulties found in the process of telling the story. So for example, this is what Alicia Cosame, an Argentine writer, also a former political prisoner during the 70s, says in her novel when she's referring to her frustration for not being able to remember certain important details about her transfer from one prison to another. In another book, Kosame suggests that the past is reinvented in the present. We usually do not associate invention or creation or imagination with the construction of narratives related to human right violations. But these questions involve also an approach to narratives about human rights with a simultaneous emphasis on creation and invention and the long lasting effects of a violence that remains always present. Let's stop for a moment to think about some common elements in the definition of trauma, at least those aspects that are more relevant for us today. Some of these definitions share the idea of the existence of an overwhelming event or series of events that have some of the following effects. The loss of meaning, the loss of the sense of connection, the loss of the sense of control. In some other instances, trauma is understood as an experience that at the time it takes place is not fully grasped. And the experience is not necessarily remembered, but associated to the idea of recurrence, the past that becomes present and not through memory, but through disruptive physical reactions. We could perhaps say that the storytelling, and in the case of this presentation in the form of literature or film or theater, might restore some of this control over the narrative, over the connection between different pieces, and among the sentences that are used to restore meaning. But now going back to the relation to human rights, we can say that artistic practices make possible a different construction of meaning and a reinterpretation of the past and the memories about the past. This is important because all these practices make it stronger the culture that is needed in order to address the wrongdoings of the past and to promote the legal norms and judicial mechanisms that will ensure the respect for human rights. I will now go to the second part of the title of our collaborative, at the crossroads of arts and sciences, to mention a concept that is used in the arts, the humanities, and in neuroscience. The concept of plasticity that can be related to the molding or sculpting into a shape, or the different resolutions that can, take, can be created through the focus of a photograph. Plasticity might also be related to destruction as in plastic explosives, and I mention this because this meaning of plasticity has been, has been explored in some philosophical approaches to trauma and the post-traumatic subject. But, in, but the neurosciences add a meaning that is very relevant to think about narratives and artistic practices in general, the meaning of connectivity and of regeneration, plasticity as neuroplasticity as the possibility to create new neural connections. First, I will start with an example about the process of the shaping of memories, and then I will discuss with another example the process of connection and regeneration. Let's take, for example, these clips from a short film by Argentine filmmaker Paula de Luque that belongs to a collection of shorts that were, were produced in 2010 with all the celebrations of the 200 years of independence in Argentina. But I also want to mention that 2010 is an important year because many discussions about gender violence in the context of the dictatorship are taking place to the point that one court take the historical decision to understand that sexual violence in the context of state-sponsored violence is a crime against humanity. The short referred, refers to a story about the killing of a Guarani woman, an indigenous woman, and the violence of colonization. The film understands her resistance in the form of a fight represented as a dance. 
But the story cannot be told without an interruption, because at one point we see a woman falling into the river and then becoming many, many other women all falling into the river. A sequence that clearly points to the way in which citizens were assassinated during the dictatorship 40 years ago, thrown, sedated, still alive from military planes. All these bodies, in this case, female bodies, point to one of the most haunting images of the dictatorship. Then the sequence of the fight dance continues until we see the tragic death of her burning in the fire. The director is connecting here two different traumatic events, the trauma of the military dictatorship and the trauma of colonization. The short film is giving shape to this intersection of violences and proposing us to understand them as related in such a way that it reinforces the connection between the crimes of the dictatorship and the genocidal violence of colonization, but also making visible something that had remained invisible in Argentina before 2010, the specific violence suffered by women. So if we're thinking about art and literature and films and photography, performances, theater, we're never only talking about what is said or represented. We're also thinking about how is said or represented the aesthetics. What is revealed about the traumatic event is not only found in what is said, but in the form that shapes the narrative, either in texts or films. I have mentioned the way in which different narratives are shaped in artistic practices, and perhaps a neuroscientist can talk about the possible impact of storytelling and narratives in general in the brain. But my question here as a scholar who works in the humanities is about the more metaphorical use of the concept of plasticity in the neurosciences. It's about the possibility of rewiring and the possibility of regeneration and the role that narratives might have in this process. What might be the connections, not only thinking about one individual or one individual brain, but in terms of community, in the encounter around the telling of a story, and what might be the impact of such connections in the construction of memory, but also circuits of memory, and not for an individual person, but for other human beings, including those who are watching, reading, or listen, listening those stories. And I want to give an example of this process of connection and regeneration that takes place not only through narratives, but also through the staging of a theater play that focuses on a traumatic event, because it stages the transformation through the process of testimonial storytelling and retelling and the reconnection through the engagement in art. The place was presented here at the Walker Center in Minneapolis not long ago and had veterans of war as actors. The title of the play, Minefield. The director, Lola Arias. The play has six characters, all of them veterans of the 1982 Malvinas Falkland War, fighting in opposite sides of the war, all together on the stage. So the first step of the play was at some point the testimonial narrative of each of the veterans. But the play is not about those initial narratives, but about the dialogue and the encounter of those veterans face to face enemies during the war, and actors who narrate and perform their own story in this play. Even when they tell their different experiences of the British and Argentine sides, the play focuses on what the veterans have in common. I return to the plasticity of the narratives, the different form the narratives take from the initial storytelling, including the transformations that come from the encounter itself and the rehearsals, but also the transformation of the narrative through the artistic direction that invite us to see the play creating different narratives, not only of personal testimonies, one after another, but combining them in a certain way. The play stages that transformation from the initial narratives to narratives that are the result of a dialogue with other veterans, especially with those who were enemies, discussing the traumatic experience that they all had in common even though it was in opposite size, transforms the narrative. And at the end of the play, they all play music together in the same band with a song that talks about their experience, their pain, and the horrors of the war. Now, 
what is the role of the listener or the viewer in this process? Because if there is something I learned from reading accounts of survivors, is their complaint that they did not feel heard, that literally there are no ears to hear their stories. And in many instances, this reluctance is expressed as a questioning of the accuracy of the narratives or an insistence on their inconsistencies, a suspicion, a disbelief, distrust in relation to what they have to say and many times to what they are not saying. So the expectation of the listener might be an obstacle for many survivors, as we can see in this quote. And here is where come learning uh, about narratives of artistic manifestations and literary texts can might give us the tools to think about these gaps, these silences, and even inaccuracies, or the process of rewriting the story or transforming the narratives. In the particular cases I mentioned, working with artistic and testimonial narratives come, that come from Latin America can help us point to narratives of trauma that involve interpretations of traumatic events that are deeply rooted in specific political and historical scenarios and that therefore reclaim their own specificity. I am going to use a quote by Colombian writer Gabriel Garcia Marquez because it speaks loudly about these specificities in relation between aesthetics and trauma. When he received the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1982, he referred extensively to the reality of Latin America and the massacres and dictatorships and those seeking refuge in other countries just to stay alive. A reality not of papers, he states, but he also talks about the cre a creativity full of sorrow and beauty. And then referring to the role of the artist, he mentioned the lack of conventional means to render our lives believable. This is such an eloquent way to express that even when trauma is about human suffering, human beings are marked by their own cultures and identity and by historical and political realities. And this is also what recent attempts to revisit theories of trauma in the humanities have been trying to propose, the decolonization of trauma studies precisely through narratives that come from other parts of the world. And then of course require us to learn more and more about other perspectives, other memories, other aesthetics. I want to conclude with a question about the intersections of neuroscience and the humanities and the art. There is a scholarship about the effects of aesthetics in the brain, be it literature, film, or art. And that implies the question, not only about how we feel in our likes or dislikes when we read literature or, lo or look at an art piece or a film, but also about the impact of such experience in the brain. But what happened if we have trauma to this question? And I mean, when we have the haunting presence of the traumatic event, what can we learn from the neurosciences about this intersection? In particular, if we consider that many times all these literary and artistic practices are a way of keeping the memories of the past alive so that human rights violations and the crimes committed during dictatorships, genocide or conflicts are not repeated. And what I mean here is that in addition to the aesthetics and the emphasis on memory, these cultural practices are rooted in a commitment to human rights advocacy and they play an important role in the transformations needed to support a culture that is profoundly committed to the respect of human rights. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Forsenito. Um, just one moment and we'll get Professor Ferran's um, deck loaded up here. All right, welcome, Professor Fran. Well, we're going to shift now um, geographical context to Spain. Events in Spain this past year have made it clear once again, as has happened repeatedly since the death of Spain's long-lived dictator, General Francisco Franco, in 1975, 
how difficult it is for the country to confront the traumatic legacies of the violence of its recent past. Last year, on the 20th of November, the anniversary of Franco's death, major demonstrations took place in Spain in honor of the dictator's memory, some in front of the dictator's mausoleum, the monumental Valle de los Caídos, Valley of the Fallen. Although such pro-Franco manifestations have taken place every year since his death, last year they had an added urgency, for people were protesting the recent decision taken by the socialist government to finally exhume Franco's body and have his family bury him elsewhere. We'll see some of the images of the demonstrations with all the uh, requisite fascist salute and uh, symbols. And as you can see by the last slide, makes Spain great again. This resurgence of far right rhetoric and ideology is not um, limited to Spain. Uh, the government, in deciding to exhume Franco's body, had finally come to an important conclusion, that a dictator who imposed on Spain a bloody repression for almost 40 years should not be allowed to rest in the monument he himself built to glorify his own memory and legacy, a monument, we should add, that was partly created by slave labor, by um, prisoners that had lost the civil war that he had begun, um, many of whom died during the construction. Now, Franco's dictatorship started at the end of a bloody three-year civil war, which began in 1936, when he led a coup d'etat against the democratically elected left-wing government of Spain. His repression included killing over 130,000 Spaniards during, the long, during and long after the civil war, leaving tens of thousands of victims of extrajudicial executions strewn in mass graves throughout the country. Spain is, uh, by the way, the second country in the world with the highest number of mass graves, second only to Cambodia. Forcing about half a million Spaniards into exile, detaining hundreds of thousands of political prisoners in a vast system of over 150 concentration camps throughout the country, and stealing thousands of children from female prisoners to give to families supportive of the regime. The legacy of that repression, like the 450 foot tall stone cross atop the Valle de los Caídos, casts a long shadow. The devotion that many still feel for the dictator is part of that legacy. So is the lack of understanding on the part of large sectors of Spanish society of the magnitude of the repression imposed by the Franco regime on Spain especially in the immediate post-war era after 1939, but all the way up to his death in 1975. One detail is illuminating in this respect. In a 2008 national poll asking people about their impression of the Franco regime, a third of the Spaniards responding had an overall positive evaluation of the regime, claiming that it had, and I quote, maintained peace, order, and national unity, um, which were, of course, some of the um, uh, ideals uh, expressed by the regime for, for justifying its rule. A more recent uh, detail, um, uh, there is a new party in Spain called Vox, a far-right party um, founded in 2013 that is growing uh, in representation for the first time last year. Uh, it won 12 seats in the regional elections in uh, Andalusia, the south of Spain, and will very probably uh, um, gain some representation in the national parliament at the end of this month in the elections. Um, it is uh, growing in, in popularity. Now today, I will briefly present an art project by Catalan multimedia artist Frances Torres, born in Barcelona in 1948, whose long artistic trajectory presents a continued meditation on trauma, memory, and violence. His work explores the long lasting legacies of past violence on individuals and societies uh, and has been greatly influenced by his own intergenerational trauma of belonging to a family that fought for the losing side of the Spanish Civil War and suffered the repression imposed on the war's losers by Franco. His maternal grandfather, having fought in defense of the Second Republic during the Civil War, was imprisoned for several years after the war, leaving the family in very precarious conditions a family history which Torres has often made an explicit part of his artistic projects. As he has stated on numerous occasions, I am the product of a war that I never lived through, our war, and that nevertheless has made me who I am 
on an emotional, social, and ideological level. And one of the uh, objectives of most of Torres' work is precisely to go against this legacy uh, of the, the way Franco has been seen in Spain that allows for people to still today think that um, it wasn't so bad to have uh, the dictatorship. Now, I want to sh uh, share with you how, in his work, the critical exploration of his personal story serves Torres as a springboard for broader reflection on the interrelationship between trauma and history, both on a personal and collective level. Using the languages of various media, media such as photography, video installation, and performance art in ways that break down barriers between them, Torres's work also experiments ceaselessly with the limits of traditionally defined artistic practices and forces us, the public, to confront uncomfortable truths about the enduring effects of past violence on the present. The project I want to show you is related to the mass graves filled with victims of Franco's repression that I mentioned at the beginning of my intervention today. In 2007, Torres published the book of photography, Oscura es la habitación donde dormimos, Dark is the room where we sleep, which accompanied a photographic exhibit of the same name. This project documented the exhumation in 2004 of a mass grave outside the town of Villa Mayor de los Montes in the Spanish province of Burgos, undertaken by the Asociación para la Recuperación de la Memoria Histórica, a civic organization created in 2000, which has taken on the task that the Spanish government has not assumed, that of exhuming the mass graves and allowing the families of the victims found therein to give their loved ones proper burials. In the exhumation that Torres documents in this project, which took over two years, the bodies of 47 men and boys were exhumed, identified, returned to their families, and later reburied together in a new collective mausoleum within the town cemetery. They had all been killed together by Franco's sympathizers on September 14, 1936. And this is a map that just shows you all of the mass graves uh, throughout Spain, and, and you can see that they literally covered the whole territory of the country. Torres' exhibit that accompanied the book was inaugurated in the fall of 2007 in the International Center of Photography in New York City, alongside retrospectives of the Civil War photography of Robert Capa and Gerda Taro, two great uh, war photojournalists that covered the Spanish Civil War. Despite the fact that Torres' book and exhibit are in many ways presented as a realistic portrayal uh, graphically, graphically documenting the process of the exhumation in detail. I want to briefly mention here how the work also calls into question and destabilizes its own nature as testimony in a manner that both upholds the importance of the visual image to relate such an experience at the same time as it calls attention to the images limitations in such a task, similar to what Anna was mentioning earlier of the gaps in a testimony. Um, it is important to note that Torres incorporates in his book several direct references to the great Spanish Enlightenment artist Francisco José de Goya y Lucientes. Goya's series of prints entitled The Disasters of War, created between 1810 and 1820, present images from the Spanish Civil War of Independence against the French invasion of Spain by Napoleon that lasted from 1808 to 1814, which Goya witnessed firsthand. Goya's work is considered paradigmatic of an artist's attempt to document and give visual testimony to the horrors of war. Torres includes in his book a detail of one image from Goya's series, entitled Enterrar y Callar, To Bury and Keep Quiet. Torres reproduces in his book a small section of Goya's print on translucent paper. You can not see it all that well, but that's a little section of the Goya's print. And the translucent paper allows one of Torres's own photographs from the exhumation to be seen through so that you can see two images uh, together. The title of Goya's image is indeed most relevant to the contemporary context of the exhumations of mass graves from the Spanish Civil War, inasmuch as the families of victims of Franco's repression have had to keep quiet for decades, although they, unlike the figures in Goya's print, were never allowed to bury their dead. The parallels in the situations are made manifest by Torres in his superposition of the two images. The violence of a war in the early 19th century is not unlike that of a war in the early 20th 
and both remain absolutely relevant at the beginning of the new millennium, when so many bodies in mass graves remain yet to be exhumed in Spain. It is said that about 30,000 bodies were still in mass graves at the beginning of the uh, millennium in Spain. Uh, but there is a play that Goya enacts between the captions of his images and the images themselves that um, already show that he is, he is uh, experimenting with what can actually be shown uh, even while he is uh, presenting a project that um, is directly uh, giving a testimony of the war. And I believe that it is in this play um, in which Goya actually is questioning the very capacity to give testimony within a project that is given testimony that uh, Torres is also alluding to in his project. And I'll be just give a brief overview of a few uh, images of uh, Torres where I see this might be uh, happening. But um, one of the quintessential images within Goya's um, Disasters of War is number 14, um, in which you see the, you see the image before you, and the caption says "Yolobi, I saw it," which is taken to be the most simple and a, a direct affirmation of uh, a work of art that is giving testimony to a, an atrocity that has happened right before the artist's eyes. And yet Goya is being uh, deliberately ambiguous with his caption and the fact the caption that is supposed to explain what you're seeing in the image does not explain very much. Uh, as you see in the image, there are many people looking. Um, so the yo, the I, is ambiguous. It's not clear is it Goya who's looking or any one of the uh, people represented in the caption who are looking in different directions. Um, I saw it. The it is equally ambiguous uh, because all of the figures are looking, as you can see, outside the frame. The horror is really outside the frame. So Goya, while he is supposedly uh, using his art to show us the horror of war, leaves the horror beyond the frame, as if there is something that is too much uh, to actually be um, depicted. Um, now Torres uh, will play with this uh, notion of what we can see and not see in some of his images. In this image, for example, we see the uh, the mass grave in the middle of the bucolic scene of a forest. Um, by showing us this image, we are made to realize that when we're you know traveling through Spain, there might be many images of uh, you know beautiful pastoral scenes that have uh, underneath them um, mass graves from the war. We can't always see uh, the horror. Uh, an image um, of one of his uh, uh, photographs. And maybe um, I'll stop with this one so we have enough time uh, for questions. But um, in an image like this one, where you see the marriage ring still on a skeleton hand, um, Torres is documenting the process of the exhumation uh, and given, uh, giving us a direct image of what he saw. But I think the image also asks us to think about all the things that are impossible to document with this photograph, all the things that were lost, um, everything that this family would have lost by losing uh, their family member, and how could that ever be uh, documented? Um, so um, the, the, this is a visual uh, um, manifestation of the kind of gaps um, and uh, limits to what um, can actually be given testimonial form that makes us think about the different ways in which art can show us uh, traumatic experience, but also allow us to understand the limits of our capacity to fully understand. Uh, that trauma. All right. Thank you to all three professors. We have about uh, 10 minutes uh, for uh, Q&A. Um, so if you have questions, feel free to um, uh, type it into the questions pane on the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, we have a, a question that I'm going to direct to Brian first. That's, I think, just kind of about the basic definitions or maybe differences in, in trauma. 
Um, one uh, uh, guest today asked, how would one, uh, are there differences between, let's say, a trauma that we've been talking about with whether war, genocide, mass killings, um, versus the trauma of, let's say, a very traumatic car crash where one one person you know survives but is in a coma for weeks and the other person dies um i guess from a psychology standpoint are, uh, what are the differences or how would you, how would you look at that the greatest number of people in the united states affected by ptsd had that triggered by a motor vehicle accident mm -hmm. because there are so many and if you survive with memory of that accident you will have a very hard time returning to driving again. I think that's only natural and expectable, but there are many who don't because of their fear of driving and their traumatization experienced through the accident. So there's that, and it is uh, for all too many, well, it's, uh, it's a one-time thing that changes their lives forever. Mm -hmm. uh, much of what we're talking about here today uh, involves uh, repeated exposure to trauma, sustained exposure to trauma, that of war and genocide and prolonged combat. So the odds that people's lives will be affected by PTSD long-term go up. The, the more the trauma exposure, um, the more severe the exposure. But there are plenty of people living with, with us in this country who have PTSD based upon a motor vehicle accident, a single assault, and so forth. Thank you. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the GoToWebinar control panel. And uh, we still have a few minutes left uh, this afternoon um, to talk, uh, or to field some questions. One thing I wanted to, to pose to the three of you, um, as we mentioned during the introductions, this is an interdisciplinary uh, project. Um, so maybe talk about either some of the um, groups or venues that you've been uh, taking your collaborative research out to or just other groups that uh, might be of, of interest to this uh, collaborative uh, research that you're doing. Well, we have... Um uh we have um members of our collaborative from i think it's about 19 departments in the university um and um you know some of them have been coming to the, the different events that we've had we've invited uh speakers um from abroad like you know frances torres uh came uh that i spoke about um but also scholars from uh uh, with, within the United States have come and given us talks. Um, and so, I mean, we're, yeah. we're starting with this project. Yeah. Um, another part of the project that we're hoping to um, uh, organize is to bring the artist Frances Torres for a semester long visit to do a project with veterans, um, mm -hmm. which would directly uh, connect uh, our three uh research areas um but we're still looking for enough funding uh to bring him so if anybody has any ideas of funding for such a project sure. please contact us there you go. um but that would be very exciting so we could do maybe something like the like the movie um that anna showed with uh with veterans i mean um we could maybe create something like that right here um, at the university. Um, we're not sure what it would be, but sure. we're still looking for that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and if anyone out there is interested, um, um, all U of M employees are cert. We can. Uh, that's why I have the slide up of the presenters. So if uh, uh -huh. you uh, uh, Google and uh, can find uh, preferred work contact information for all three, if uh, if this subject is of interest. Uh, this one's for uh, Professor uh, Ferran. Um, how do you see Spain moving forward with movements like Vox arising in the political field? Well, um, I don't know. We have we have a general elections right now, and the 28th of this month, I think, just coming up. 
And I am very fearful. I am afraid that there is a large possibility that a coalition of right-wing uh, parties may actually win. Um, and uh, if that happens, then um, I think Franco is good and safe in his uh, mausoleum, um, um, because that's one of the things that has happened is that when uh, we have we've had initiatives um, to deal with some of the um, human rights abuses of Francoism uh, initiated by by left wing governments, but then we have elections, and if a right wing government comes in, they just undo everything. Um, that should be familiar to people here. Um, so, um, but uh, I really see, I mean, in Spain, one of the big differences between Spain and, for example, Argentina is that the dictatorship lasted so long, almost 40 years, uh, which was able to then kind of socialize several generations uh, of people, which, which is precisely why then um, you know, the image of the dictatorship not being quite as bad um, is possible for so many people to hold. Uh, fewer people really kind of even live through uh, by now the, the, the hardest part of the dictatorship. Um, and then the, 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 the dictatorship's own view of itself has kind of permeated society to the point that it, it comes back. Um, and um, so, but but what I was going to say with that is that I think that in Spain, it's very much of a long-term process where uh, there, and, you know, initiatives are taken, then there's a couple of steps back, but eventually new, new initiatives are taken, then you know, they, they may be undone. That's also a little familiar in Argentina, right, with the different uh, amnesty laws. Um, so in the long term, I'm optimistic. In the shorter term, Perhaps not so much, but um, maybe we can talk at the beginning of May and, and see what happened. Sure. Just one final question um, for the group. Uh, one attendee asks, what PTSD symptoms are often seen in war refugees? If that, if there's a different, maybe a difference between that versus let's say a soldier or... Um, refugees have experienced multiple traumas and a great deal of stress and distress. So depending upon what happened in their home country, um, we have with us uh, many of the Hmong whose uh, families experienced not only war at the hands of the North Vietnamese, but the trauma of trying to escape the Vietnamese being held in um, uh, camps, some, sometimes for years where conditions were poor, and then many took desperate measures to escape and make it to uh, our country. So uh, <clears throat> their experiences of PTSD are um, not drastically different from others who have experienced a lot of trauma over uh, a long time period, but nightmares are certainly central uh, and can be lifelong. Um, the um, the reluctance to talk about it, I have not encountered so much uh, among refugees. Uh, there is strong family support. We're all here together. This is a better life, and I want to tell you about it. So we don't see a lot of avoidance and withdrawal. But the central problems of being quite distressed when unexpectedly reminded of being on guard, um, uh, of still having sleep problems in addition to the nightmares, those are very common. Well, I just wanna say thank you again to all three professors for sharing their time and talents with our, uh, the alumni and friends uh, on the webinar today. Um, you know, I think this is very exciting just as far as demonstrating the interdisciplinary research that's happening at the U, um, really the, um, the art and science of, you know, the liberal arts plus, you know, neuroscience and all the intersections that happen with that. And so, again, thank you uh, to each of you for uh, being here today. And again, uh, this um, webinar and their uh, research was uh, made possible through the generous support of the College of Liberal Arts Interdisciplinary Collaborative Workshop, the Institute of Advanced Study, and the Imagine Fund. 
And uh, thank you again to our Alumni Association members who helped make, in part, this uh, webinar series possible. Uh, we have over nearly half a million alumni around uh, the world, and uh, we're so glad that um, you take uh, time to join us uh, for these conversations uh, during the year. This is the last webinar for spring. Uh, we'll be back up probably on the horse uh, with new webinars in the fall. Uh, so stay tuned for that through your alumni emails. And until then, I wish you all the best. Have a great summer and we'll see you soon.